lunch series. I'm Sharon Marr. I'm a professor of philosophy and I'm chair of the Department of Latin American Studies and Women's Studies at the University of Scranton. And I'm substituting as your host today for Sandra Myers. Um, as I think many of you, if not all of you know, um, many, many if not all of the Shemel Forum speakers are culled from Sandra's elaborate, extensive Rolodex. <laughs> and many, many, many of these speakers are also very dear friends of Sandra, and today is no exception. Um, so Sandra deeply sends her regrets, but she was called away um, to um, engage in service for um, the White House's uh, Commission on Presidential Scholars. When she scheduled this meeting, she didn't realize that they were going to end up having a, a meeting, so she ended up having to leave. So she sends her regrets, um, and I now have the privilege of introducing Dr. Alita Black. Uh, Dr. Black is executive editor of the FDR Four Freedoms Digital Initiative, and research professor of history and international affairs at the George Washington University. She founded the Eleanor Roosevelt Project and chairs its advisory board. The project is designed to preserve, teach, and apply Eleanor Roosevelt's writings and discussions of human rights and democratic politics. Dr. Black also sits on the board of governors of the Roosevelt Institute, serves as the human rights chair of the No, and serves as the human rights chair of the No Limits Foundation. She's a blogger for the Huffington Post and has authored several books and articles, including Casting Her Own Shadow, Eleanor Roosevelt, and The Shaping of Post-War Liberalism, What I Want to Leave Behind, Courage in a Dangerous World, The Political Writings of Eleanor Roosevelt, and with Julie Fenzi, Democratic Women, and Oral History of the Women's National Democratic Club. She's also written many articles, and um, published um, uh, a book entitled First Women, Power, Image, and Politics from Betty Ford through Hillary Rodham Clinton. Um, and another most recent book, I think, although there's many more coming. Oh, no, 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 no. Politics and the Dream of Democracy. That, uh, that's in my head. That's in your head. <laughs> um, Dr. Black is the recipient of the Millennium Medal from the George Washington University, the 2001 Person of Vision Award from the Arlington County Commission on the Status of Women, and the James A. Jordan Award for Outstanding Dedication and Excellence in Teaching from Penn State University, Harrisburg. She has received the J.N. G. Finley Postdoctoral Fellowship at George Mason University, a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian, as well as fellowships from the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute, the Gerald R. Ford Foundation, the Harry Truman Foundation, and the United States Information Agency. She received her PhD from George Washington University and an honorary doctor of humane letters from DePaul University. Outside the classroom, Dr. Black has written teachers' guides for documentaries on the lives of Marian Anderson and Frederick Douglass, which aired on PBS, and has served as an advisor to the PBS's uh, program, American Experience Democracy, on Eleanor Roosevelt. She has curated an exhibit honoring Eleanor Roosevelt's role in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., which was displayed at the New, York's New York Customs House as part of its Beijing Plus Five exhibit. She is currently working with the National Park Service to develop curricula and other educational tools for the Eleanor Roosevelt National Historic Site and is, as I said, the executive director of the FDR for Freedoms Organization, which is going to be the subject of our talk today. Please welcome Dr. Lee Black. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys. I hate now that when you apply for grants, they put all that stuff on the web because when you send Sandra and you know my friend Sharon a two sentence introduction, they go no, they find out all the money speak and then they read the full thing. So, um, you know, I'm I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's my third time at the University of Scranton and I would do anything that my friend Sandra Myers asked. And, um, and she is indomitable, 
always positive, and as she reminds me at dinner last night in the middle of a heated discussion, get with the program. So she always helps keep me focused, and so I'm very happy to be here. And what I'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about how FDR gave us this vision and how we've forgotten what that vision is. I'm not talking about a political vision. I'm talking about a vision of rights and responsibilities and how in many ways that vision and that call to action is just as relevant now in 2012 as it was when FDR articulated it for the first time, January 6th, 1941. But before we start talking about this, I want to ask you two questions. I'm not asking you to give me answers. I just want you to hold these, you know, in that special place where your brain and your gut connect. You know, and that really private part of your spirit where you keep hope and where you keep fear and, which, and where you are honest. And now, in that middle of that dramatic moment, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> and of course, it went away. Okay. <clears throat> I just didn't want to blow into the microphone and shatter the people's eardrums. My first question to you is, what would you die for? Not who would you die for. What would you die for? My second question to you is what in your most private, bold space do you want to represent and what do you want the United States to represent? Because that's what this talk is all about. It's not about an idea or political theory. It's about what we dream and what we value enough to die for. Even when we don't know the people involved and the people look like us, or maybe it's people that we cannot stand. They may, they may be you know, our worst enemies. They may trash us nonstop. But are there fundamental core relationships and beliefs that you would die for? Because we are in that battle right now. We are in that exact same battle that FDR faced in 1949. And in some ways, sorry, my cheat sheet, because I could preach, but I'll get off the subject. In some ways, here we are 71 years after the Four Freedoms Address. The questions are more relevant now than they were then. But let me set the stage for the talk first. It's 1940, the end of 1940, as FDR begins to conceptualize what he's going to say, not only to the United States, but to the world. Let's recap where we are at the end of 1940. We have, uh, in the um, Western Front, the European Front, we have Germany and Italy now controlling Luxembourg, Denmark, Austria, Holland, Poland, and France. They will soon, um, they had made an alliance with the Soviet Union, which they have broken. That leaves this tiny little spit of an island, Great Britain, between us and fascism. That tiny little island 
is the only thing that stands between us and Hitler. Our navy is the size of Guam's. Panama has a better army. On the Pacific side, we have Japan engaged in serious incursions into China and going down into Indochina, and as we all know, ultimately will attack the United States in Pearl Harbor and the Philippines. The shadows of World War I cloud this debate. We now look at this and think it is the Great War. The vast majority of the United States do not want to fight it. Almost 68% of the United States says it is not our war. 82% of the United States thinks that Germany will win. 80 2% of the United States thinks that Germany will win the war. More than two-thirds of the United States says it's not our fight. And we are fully aware of what's going on. We are fully aware of Kristallnacht. We are fully aware of refugees. We are fully aware of blitzkrieg, of the violent search and destroy, take no prisoners approach to the expansion of the German Empire. FDR has emboldened us to become the arsenal of democracy. We will produce our way out of the war. He and George Marshall, who was the Secretary of the Army, and Stimson, who was the Secretary of War, will say, we cannot fight, we are not ready, we will get slaughtered. We cannot give ships, antiquated ships, and guns, and planes to Great Britain. We need them to defend our own shores. We are lit picking the American navels, the American naval in the time of war. We are not chomping to get into this. Why? The horrors of the First World War are still with us. We have images of poison gas. We have images of new weapons. We have huge political debates about whether or not American and um, European arms munition companies prolonged the war to, in fact, sell more weapons. There are hearings, there are dramatic hearings held in the House of Representatives and the United States Senate on war profiteers. If we supported Hoover, we think that the international, the in, in, um, interconnected, intertwined international economy is what caused the Great Depression. If we support Roosevelt, we see a very fragile recovery. The New Deal has done remarkable things, but the New Deal does not end the Great Depression. And when Roosevelt balances the budget in 1937, we go back into the Roosevelt recession. We no longer have 40% unemployment. In some places, we have 20% unemployment. The national average is about 18% unemployment. That's cut the employment rate in, unemployment rate in half but we say if we go to war, we will spin out of control, we will go back into exactly where we were in 1933, right before Roosevelt came into office. So we say it is about us. 
It is about protecting the fragility of American life. It is not about opposing fascism. So how do we move? We know because after, we know FDR. I mean, FDR left a voluminous record. And we know from oral histories, from thousands and thousands of feet, if not miles of records from his administration, what he thought. And we know that what he learned while serving as Assistant Secretary of the Navy in World War I was that the American fleet was a fragile enterprise. We really needed to beef it up. And he also learned from Wilson's mistakes. And Wilson's mistakes were both political and ideology, ideological. The first mistake was to use language that was grandiose and sweeping in its vision. Why would America enter the First World War? This was the war to make the world safe for democracy. This was the war to end all wars. And the treaty is so punitive that World War II starts before the ink on that treaty is dry. And here we are, less than 15 years after that, having a much more vicious, much more sweeping, much more devastating war. So how can you take a nation and galvanize the nation to take the risks and make the sacrifice and believe in themselves again? How can you move from, it's not going to hurt me, it's not my fight, to I am a citizen of the world as much as I am a citizen of the United States? And FDR takes several steps to do this, but the last step is perhaps his greatest speech, which was the State of the Union address he gave um, January 6, 1941 after he had been elected to an unprecedented third term as President of the United States. And in it, he sets forth a vision. Sorry, I have to read the paragraph on my Blackberry. Um, he sets forth the vision that not only galvanizes why we fight, but shapes the world that we live in today, regardless of where we live, what part of the world we live, or what party we subscribe to. It redefines the world. And it is this. I'm so you're just going to have to imagine that I'm a foot taller, that I have a melodious voice, that I have on braces, and I have one hand on a podium because the speech is copyright restricted, and I can't show you the video. So I have to, I have to, I have to read it to you. And it's, you know, it's a long State of the Union, and he goes through um, armaments discussions, he goes through military discussions, he goes through the, you know, the, the assessment of the American economy, and then he ends with this. In the future days which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is the freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy, peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere 
in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against a neighbor anywhere in the world. This is no vision of a distant millennium. It is a kind of world attainable in our own time and a kind of world that is the very antithesis of the so-called new order of tyranny which the dictators seek to create with the bomb. To that new order, we, op we oppose the greater conception, the moral order. A good society is able to face schemes of world domination and foreign revolutions alike without fear. Since the beginning of our history, we have engaged in change. In a perpetual peaceful revolution, a revolution which goes on steadily, quietly adjusting itself to changing conditions without the concentration camps or the quick lime in the ditch. The world order which we seek is the cooperation of free countries working together to build a civilized society. This nation has placed its destiny in the hands and the hearts of millions of free men and women and its faith in freedom under the guidance of God. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights or keep them. Our strength is our unity of purpose. To that high concept, there can be no solution save victory. It takes America by the heart and it lifts it up. It becomes not only the central propaganda theme to maintain American morale, but it unites the two great political passions of the United States free from and free to. Not just for us, but for the world. This is what we will die for. It will die to give us the courage and the vision to speak, to worship, to clothe, to feed, to go to school, to reduce arms, to negotiate, and more than an end to war, as FDR will say later when he conceptualizes the UN, it will be an end to the beginning of war. So let's fast forward to today. We are in periods of economic uncertainty. The world power structure has changed. We have enormous poverty not just around the world, but in the United States. 32.6% of children in the United States live below the poverty line. 32.6%. One out of every three children here in the United States live below the poverty line. One out of seven seniors live not only below the poverty line, but 80% of them live in extreme deprivation. Extreme deprivation. Which means that 80% of the elderly who are poor in the poverty line live on less than $8,000 a year in the United States of America. 80% of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. 
the majority of that lives on less than one, $1.25 a day. In countries where the majority of the population is under 18, many of them have never lived in communities that have been at peace. So how can you build a stable world? It is how can you build a conversation that will keep disparate communities together, both within the United States and within the world. I mean, everybody in this room is predominantly Caucasian. How many of you have friends who are not like you? How many of you have friends that share dramatically different political visions than you? How many of you buy in, whether you, whether you want to or not, this heated rhetoric about what one party or another party says? How many of you think automatically that Muslims are terrorists. It's the subconscious that FDR is trying to address. And when the four freedoms rally, and they rally beyond the war, they rally, you know, really until 51 or 52. They hold the world together. Now we have forgotten that conversation. But if you travel, as Sandra does, or I do, or Sharon, I mean, Sharon does Latin America. I've been to Latin America enough to get into trouble, so I can't talk about it. You know, I mean, but I do know Africa, and I know Cambodia, and I know the Balkans. And there are regions of un fathomable courage where we cannot imagine what it's like. My friend Krubo Kali, who taught at the University of Liberia in Monrovia for 17 years during a horrific civil war, had no books, had no paper, had no pencils, had no chalk, had no chairs had no blackboard. Her kids went through gunfire to go to class. Go to class, they walked through gunfire. In the midst of an extraordinary civil war that was hyped up by rubber interests, greed, cocaine, and brown brown, which is gunpowder poured in um, alcohol and drunk, which is like PCP in overdrive, 96% of the girls and women were raped. I'm not talking vaginal rape. I'm talking with tree limbs. I'm talking with bayonets. 40% of the children were kidnapped and forced to become child soldiers. They saw their parents and their friends killed in front of them. They were forced to drink brown brown, or in fact joined to have new safety, new security. They're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They've got to carry AK-47s and machetes. They kill people. They become sex slaves. For people who say the world can't change, look at Liberia right now. Look at Ellen Johnson's relief. She won the Nobel Peace Prize. Look at the women of Liberia who stopped that war. They are now rebuilding the public school systems. Violence in Liberia has dropped almost 400%. You have children walking 15, 16, 17 miles, hearing that they may be able to go to school. 
when they don't, when they have never even seen a school work. My friend Crew Bokali, do you know what her job, well she just got made an ambassador so I have to rephrase this. Do you know what her job was before that? The most gentle woman I know who has adopted 83 kids who were orphaned by war, who cared for more than 1,100 kids in the displacement centers. This woman of devout faith, do you know what her job was? To track down Al Qaeda and get their passports back. More than anybody on the planet, they understand what the four freedoms mean. We talk about it, but we don't get it. Our challenge now is to go back and look at that vision, especially now as the world is in turmoil. We don't know what's going to happen in Egypt. We don't know what's going to happen in Libya. We know what should happen in Syria, but we don't know how to make that happen yet. That involves us because the clearest way, the clearest way to show the world that there are alternatives is not only to have a strong, aggressive, military presence, but to also have a strong, aggressive American presence grounded in the four freedoms. You know, many people think the foreign aid budget in the United States is, oh, 15, 20 percent. I saw a poll last week that, that, uh, that almost 40 percent of the United States thinks we spend a third of our entire budget on foreign aid. I went, my God, Medicaid's not 30% of the foreign budget. The foreign aid budget of the United States is less than 1%. Now, I want you to think about, if you didn't have a roof over your head, if you had to go to bed every night hungry, if you had no idea that you would live another year, much less what your child's life would be like, what would your vision of your future be? What would your vision of building a new country be? And so let's segue into Eleanor Roosevelt and her interpretation of the Four Freedoms. Because when FDR signed the Atlantic Charter with Winston Churchill, you know, FDR was a, was a pretty fierce negotiator. And he said, okay, you know, you want us to come in and help. You want us to, you know, our base is for destroyers. You, wanna, you want us to engage in lend-lease. Okay, well, you've got to do one thing. You have to dismantle the British Empire. Because you cannot fight fascism. You cannot fight a moral order with the same type of condescension and inferiority, you know, and, and display, uh, convey this sense of inferiority. And so by the end of the war, it's clear that there will be a dismantling of the British, the French, the Dutch, the Chinese, and the Japanese empires. The purpose of the United Nations is to prevent another world war. We has, in, because people are terrified. We have the bomb. I'm not talking, if we dropped the bomb on this building right now, we just wouldn't have concrete left. We would have sand. Sand. People down the road in Wilkes-Barre most of their skin would melt off their bodies. The world is freaking out. So, it, and at the same time, we learn about the Holocaust. We see pictures. We've seen all those pictures now. We're anesthetized, I think, to the Holocaust. 
But then, you know, we're seeing all these pictures of the camps getting liberated. We're seeing women throwing other bodies in ditches. And the world is just beyond bleeding. We have all sacrificed, every person in this room, every person in this room has a connection to the Second World War. If you didn't fight, you had a relative to fought. If you didn't do that, you had people in defense industry. And if you didn't do that, you went into positions to take jobs that the men had when they left to go overseas. For example, 63% of all high school football coaches were women. And I guarantee you that if you look in the public school system in Scranton from 1940 to 1945, you will find out that women somewhere in Scranton coached the Scranton high school football team. It affected all of our lives. So the issue is, how are we going to heal? Not only how are we going to prevent another war, but how are we going to heal? How can we continue to hold and incorporate and build on and take courage from the four freedoms when we have seen unimaginable horror? And Eleanor Roosevelt, when she joins the first American delegate, when Truman appoints her to the first American delegation to the United Nations, um, had no expectations that she would be chairing in a committee or would have anything other than a ceremonial role at the UN. But my ER is a workaholic. And if there's anybody in the world who understood the four freedoms, it certainly was Eleanor Roosevelt, who had been in battlefields in World War I and in World War II, and who was so horrified and traumatized by what she saw that she began to carry a prayer in her wallet that said, Dear Lord, lest I continue in my complacent ways, help me to remember that somewhere someone died for me today. And if there be war, help me to remember to ask and to answer, am I worth dying for? And that's the spirit that she took in when the, when the world turned to her the world, not the United States, the 50 nations of the world who were the early founding members of the United Nations turned to her and said, will you shepherd the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Bill of Human Rights? And Eleanor accepts the challenge and she keeps one fundamental vision in front of her. Not even a vision, just an image. A world governed by fear and prejudice and violence and rape and economic savagery and military turf violence in ways that we can't envision. Or trying to come up with another vision that will stand up to that and say, the world is not inherently evil. That if, in fact, we can help the world heal, not the entire world, but people, in, individual people around the world, that we can create a new world that will have less war and more community. And that is what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is. And it is grounded primarily not on all of the, not only on all of the common scriptures of the world, not only on all of the world's desire for community and family. It is founded on the world's desire to eat, 
to be safe, to build their own community, to worship as they see fit, and to not live a life governed in fear. And so today I think that a lot of us, the more uncertain the economy becomes, the more heated the rhetoric becomes, the more we turn inward. And I think that spits on our history. And I think that is despicable conduct for the people around the world who risk their lives to defeat fascism, to win the Cold War, and to really make democracy work. And the more I'm around the world, and the more I see women and men struggle to rebuild communities, like the extraordinary, the extraordinary citizens of Kosovo, who came out of a horrific, brutal genocide that Milosevic inflicted in the former Yugoslavia and Bosnia Herzegovina. The more I see people emerging out of the conflict in Rwanda, who work together in their schools, people of different tribes, to have never again clubs, where they talk not only about how to mitigate tribal violence, but also violence against women. If you look at Liberia, a country that had an 86% illiteracy rate, a country with a 92% unemployment rate, where the only industry, the only jobs that were not devastated during the Civil War were the jobs at a Firestone, because Firestone paid everybody off so they could have the one macadamized road to go to the airport from the rubber plantations. Now, for those of you who think, well, what the hell should I care about Liberia for? I don't even want to go to the whole thing about how it's foreign, you know, how it was a colony, it was a safe place for ex-slaves to go. Let's go back to World War I. Anybody know the first country on the planet to come to the aid of the United States in World War I? Wasn't Britain, wasn't Canada, wasn't Australia, wasn't Brazil, Liberia. The rubber plantations in Liberia. Liberians, and think about the risk that that took. They are a tiny, tiny little country on the west coast of Africa. And they went to President Roosevelt and said, we have the world's largest supply of rubber. It's yours. Don't you think that creates a little bit of loyalty? Don't you think that the, that the purpose of the United States is to honor courage and to help stand with struggle? Because most of the world, I do a lot of work with, with folks who, who come over here for, you know, from uh, countries that are re really re retrying to build and rewrite their constitutions and, and, and emerge from massive destruction. You know, when they look at us and they think we're perfect, they think we were born this way. They, like us, have forgotten our own struggle. Our Constitution took voting rights away from women. Do you know that? In 1683, women could vote in specific colonies in Maryland. They lost that with the Constitution. Women didn't get the right to vote again until 1920. It's not a century of struggle. It's almost three centuries of struggle. Look at the United States' involvement with the slave trade, before and after, in theory, we outlawed it. 
What is our record with immigration? People think we started this way. They need to learn that we struggled, that we also risked our lives for what we believed in, that, we, that it took us time to understand what the four freedoms mean. And at the same time, we need to remember that. We can't expect Egypt to come out and be, boom, by Mubarak stable. You know? We, we can go in and we can help. We can help negotiate. We can't dictate. How do you navigate that? Part of that is credibility. And I would argue that the credibility of the United States is, is how much we balance and how much we articulate in a very sincere fashion our commitment to the four freedoms at home and our commitment to the four freedoms abroad. Because right now we are an extraordinary example and we are getting some credibility back. But we have to figure out how to understand what a vision means, what a national soul means in a way that is encompassing and strict and directive and powerful and welcoming. And that was the gift that Franklin Roosevelt gave the world with the Four Freedom Speech. We can talk about Dr. Win the War, we can talk about Dr. New Deal, we can talk about the date that will live in infamy, we can talk about the GI Bill of Rights, we can talk about Glass-Steagall, we can talk about restructuring mortgages on, you know, for, for homes and farms. We can talk about, you know, beginning to have money for public education. We can talk about supports of the arts. We can talk about all of the extraordinary, complicated, sometimes magisterically effective, sometimes, oh my God, why did we ever do this, ineffective programs of the New Deal. But in my book, what came out of this was America's profound ability to understand that just because we fought for ourselves, that didn't mean that we didn't fight for somebody else. And that freedom is not only freedom from, it's freedom to. And that food and shelter and education and the right to live in a safe space is what makes democracy grow. That's what builds stable communities. And our ability to have intense, passionate, respectful conversations with people with whom we have profound disagreements and try to find common ground to compromise up, as Eleanor Roosevelt would say. That is what the American way is. And it starts in tables here. You think Washington, you think that the folks in Capitol Hill, my friends up there, my staff friends up there, would act this way if it wasn't going on down here? No way! Absolutely no way. We can't say it's them, it's also us. Because in addition, you know, if there is a fifth freedom, you know, if I could be sort of bold enough to articulate or to suggest that, that one other freedom should be added, it's the freedom to be who we are in a way that doesn't require yelling. <laughs> 
And that's only going to start when we do it here. So I'd like to stop and open questions to see, you know, to have a conversation if you think that the challenge that um, I've posed about the relevance of the four freedoms today is, um, is uh, in any way uh, a sound or a wacko argument. And um, there is no right or wrong uh, question here. It's about how we listen to each other and respond. And so I appreciate your attention very, very much. Oh, no, 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 no. So who thinks I'm crazy? Anybody got any questions? Uh, listen, you guys are smart. I've been hearing about how many questions you have for two days. Oh. Yes, ma'am. I just have a comment. Uh, in preparing for coming here, I read on the internet that the Universal Declaration of Rights is the most translated document in, in the world. world. Yeah. The, co uh, the, the comment was um, that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the most translated document in all the world. It is, absolutely, and is the basis for more constitutions and more governments around the world than our own declaration and our own constitution. I mean, part of it is, is that um, Eleanor Roosevelt and others who were on the committee, real, as well, especially Eleanor, argued that the world had to have a vision in order to really get the courage that they needed to look at, to, to, um, to look at self, for citizens to look themselves in the mirror and sort of take one step at a time. And so she argued that rather than do an, um, a legal document from the start, where it would take lawyers three years to negotiate where to put a comma, you know, that, you know, that, you know, that the world should come together and try to find a core understanding of humanity. And it really is a remarkable achievement. If you think about people who are around the table had very different understandings of God, very different, you know, whether even there was a God, a very different understanding of marriage, a very different understanding of private property, whether private property existed. And I'm not talking about the communists, you know. I'm also talking about, you know, countries in Latin America and in Africa who are evolving and who are trying to figure out, you know, the whole colonial system. Um, they have different understandings of child labor. Who do you work for? Do you work for your community? Do you work for your government? Do you work for yourself? I mean, there is a fundamental disagreement on every single thing that we hold holy. And what Eleanor Roosevelt was able to do in an, an unimaginable feat is to keep that conversation going and to come out with consensus. And the consensus document was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article one of which says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should treat one another in a spirit of brotherhood. It was adopted December 10th, 1948. It is the first time in the history of the world that men, women, and children are all treated as equal human beings. It is the first time in the history of the world that people of all religions are treated equally. People of all races are treated equally. People of all nationalities are treated equally. So it is the model for emerging governments and emerging constitutions in a way that gives them a platform that they can then begin to codify. Does that answer your question? Okay, anybody else? Please? Yes, ma'am. You said the one word that bothers me the most in this whole society of ours, and that is greed. You said it once. How do we stop this horrible, overwhelming greed? Um, I, boy, if I knew that, I'd get the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, what can we do? Well, I, th I think there are many things that we can do. I mean, I think that there, there are extraordinary organizations 
that are doing profound work around the world on this. And I am not talking, you know, I mean, I'm a big fan of microcredit, but I'm just not talking about microcredit. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Acumen Fund, for example. And the Acumen Fund is um, a not-for-profit social investment fund that goes around the world that finds young entrepreneurs who have great ideas you know, that, will, uh, that will address problems in education, in healthcare, in transportation, and the environment. And they help give these young entrepreneurs the, the business training that they need, you know, depending upon which system, which government system they're in, on how to leverage their, their, their businesses up to expand employment. For example, um, in, in, um, in some uh, parts of India and in, um, and in Central Africa, it, it's the delight. It, it's a solar-powered light, okay? It costs five bucks, which is a hell of a lot of money. But for that five bucks, you don't, you don't have to buy kerosene, Women can go to school at night. Children can study around the fire, uh, around the light instead of the fire. It decreases deaths from, from lung disease, from breathing in um, kerosene fumes, and also deaths by fire. So, I mean, I think they're really inventive ways like that. Um, I think that, um, you know, that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really bad at this. I mean, every year, uh, okay, I'll just beat myself up. Okay, I have these four bonus children who live behind me, who I love more than life itself, okay? I just came back from Green Bay. They are absolute neurotic Green Bay Packers fans. I bought so much Green Bay Packers stuff for them that I had to ship it back. Don't you think it would have been okay if I got Ryan and Kevin one thing apiece rather than a sweatshirt and a toy and Packers um, um, paper napkins, you know? But I mean, so, so we, you know, we, have to, we have to learn to moderate that. But I think that, that what we have to do primarily is to realize that it's not just about us. I mean, I, in my favorite story, I guess, I have to give a shout out to a school, East Chautauqua Lake High School, I mean, East Chautauqua Lake School in East Chautauqua, New York, right outside of Mayville. This school had 836 kids in it. Okay, there's one traffic light in the entire county, and that's like right in front of their school. Every year, they have to raise money to take their school trip. I do some work with their teachers, and one of their teachers knew that I'd come back from Liberia, and I was so excited about all my kids. I was showing them my pictures. You know, I'd come, come back from Ellen's graduation, and I'm like, oh my God, look at this. This is not cool, you know? And, and, and they, were, they were driving back, and they said, okay, well, how can I show my kids what school is like. The students and all the parents in that school, all 836 voted to raise money not to bring their kids to Washington or to New York, but to raise $17,000 to rehab a school in Liberia, which they did. It changed their lives. Their test scores went up, their school attendance went up, teacher satisfaction went up, and they saw the power of what they could do. So I don't want to say it's about greed if I can make a friendly amendment. I would say it's about me and, us and. It's not just about... Um, what I can do for me, but it's getting people to believe in themselves and to believe in something else big enough to take a risk. Because if individuals don't do it, nothing's going to happen. And I think, I, I, honest to God, believe that the world has changed one student at a time. You know, anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. You know, if it's a girl or a boy, I mean, I, I would, you know, just the number one thing we do know, the one statistic that we do know, is that if you send a girl to school, that's the one statistic um, across the board that says there will be less violence, more stable economies, and there will be um, 
um, less fighting for food and clothes. I mean, that's the one statistic that we know, you know, from the left, the right, the vital center, no matter where in the world it shows up. Which, in a totally different point, is why I am so profoundly worried about what will happen in Afghanistan. I mean, the women that I know in Afghanistan, there are no words for what will happen to them. No words. No words. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, as a former educator, <laughs> I had a young girl staying with me one summer. She was working at a camp, and she was from Sylvania. Uh -huh. And just to point out how suppressed she was in her education, my aunt asked her, well, what faith do you practice? And all she said to her was, I was baptized Orthodox. We had to explain to her Catholic Protestant. Can you imagine being suppressed, not knowing what's going on because somebody decided what you should know? Well, I mean, that happens in the United States, too. Yeah. yeah. May I just, like, to meet yeah. someone and experience them saying, Absolutely. I don't know. And just, but just imagine... I mean, I, I just can't imagine not wanting to stand with someone who risked everything they have to take that one step. I'm talking about bullets. I'm talking about torture. I'm talking about deprivation. I'm talking about stuff that we just cannot imagine to build a better world. You know, and I open my closet and I have, you know, size 12 clothes when I was skinny, you know, and size 16 clothes when I was, mm -hmm, you know. And, I, you know, I mean, I, I just think the privilege of my life is to have, I mean, this sounds so condescending, but Americans don't teach me about my country. It's the people who fight to build their countries, who teach me about my country. No, and I mean, people are gifts. I mean, they look different than us, but they're gifts. And so I think we have to figure out how to, how to think about ourselves and others at the exact same time. Yes, ma'am. Can I go down there to bring her the mic? Okay, sorry. I want to get you on camera. <laughs> I never, you know, and everybody can hear you. This is just an observation. A, I, a lot of people that I really respect and a lot of politicians and everybody often talk about America's preeminence in the world uh -huh. and slipping and we have to be first and we have to, and I think that's counter to what's going to bring us to the point where you're talking about with the four freedoms. We have to, we have to reach out and on an equal basis to people and stop thinking about us having to be first in the world, first in everything. It's just an observation. What, oh. what do you think? Oh, thank you. Did everybody hear that? Okay. Um, sorry, I'm ordered to stand up here in front of the... Um, I mean, I... I, um, you know, I, I, I see both sides of that. I mean, I, I want... Um, I want America to be America again. I want us to, you know, to really take off. And there's some things that we're doing that, um, you know, that, that to quote Hel uh, Helen Keller, makes my soul stand erect. You know, I think some of the work that we're doing in the State Department is, you know, work that I've rated my entire life to see us do. But, um, but I think that what does American preeminence mean? You know, does American preeminence mean um, economic might without, um, you know, devoid of four freedoms values? Does it mean military might, you know, devoid, devoid of four freedoms values? You know, I, I would argue that if we fact, in fact figured out how to um, embrace in a very diverse way the four freedoms, it would secure American preeminence, not just economically but militarily. And, but, I, but I agree with you that we don't have to, um, we don't have to dominate, but there's, there is a leadership role that we must play. And so the issue is how can we lead 
in a way that takes everybody, as many people as possible forward without, um, with, with shafting as few people as possible, if I could be speaking real politic. Does that answer your question? Well, um, we have five minutes. Yes, sir. I'll probably never get another chance to tell this story. I'm a retired physician, and when I was an intern, they only had oxygen through oxygen tents. Uh -huh. And this one lady was dying. She had the last rites. And uh, she asked her doctor if it was possible for her to have sex with her husband before she died. And he said, it's absolutely out of the question. And she said, please. So we emptied out the room, unzippered the oxygen tent, and he had sex with her. And she survived. And they went home, and every day she got better and better and better. And, but her husband got sadder and sadder, and one day she looked out the picture window and she went up to him and she said, Aby, what's the matter with you? How come you're so sad? He says, I was thinking, maybe I could have saved Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> oh, oh, I have to tell you, man, I'm going to quote you around the world. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> oh my God, is that true? Wow, I can't wait to go call the family and tell them that one. <laughs> okay. Well, anybody else? <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's going to be hard to top that one, though. <laughs> well, I, I was a teacher, and I'm really, really concerned at the level of our education. Um, when I taught, I taught in North Africa, uh -huh. and those students knew more about our government working than our kids did here. And it worries me that yeah. we're so, we're down. Yeah. And I don't know what. Um, the question is, um, uh, how can we um, turn the education system around so that we can, in fact, uh, produce bold, daring students and citizens? Is that a fair paraphrase? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, um, I have a friend, um, I, I just had a conversation with a woman two weeks ago who uh, runs, runs the Rex Foundation in, um, in California, and she started this extraordinary thing called The World As It Should Be, which is a program that goes into the schools that um, gets kids to use the performing arts and literature and uh, you know, theater and dance and to create um, a vision of the world and then use that to sort of step back and look at what it takes to build it. And I'm, you know, I'm, really, I'm really intrigued by that. I have, a, I have a whole lot of respect for her because she's going in schools that are, um, are dysfunctional and really uh, creating something wonderful. I mean, she was telling me a story about one school that, that she went to that had a funeral for public education. The kids, the kids had a funeral for public education in the play. And what does that tell you about the kids' opinion of the school that they're in? You know, so I think that it's tough. Um, I mean, I... Um, I never thought in a gazillion million years that if I went into a classroom, I would turn to a kid and say, you will take your hat off and you will look at me. And my line about this is, they don't pay me enough to teach kindergarten. <laughs> you know, and, um, and so there's, um, I think we have to figure out how to do that, but we have to do it in a way that's not unequally um, enforced, but I think No Child Left Behind has been an unmitigated disaster. And I, I mean, and I'm not an unbridled critic. I mean, I, you, know, I, uh, you know, I believe in unions, but I think there are huge problems with the teachers unions, and I give Rand, Randy Weingarten credit for trying to, you know, trying to do some stuff with the AFT. I mean, the NEA, we got to work on a little more. I, I, mean, I mean, I got it backwards. But, um, you know, but I think, um, 
I, I mean, I know all the arguments against it. I mean, I absolutely know all the arguments against it. But I still passionately believe that every student in the United States should be required to have a year of public service. Yay. You know, and I mean not at home. You know, and I mean, you know, because I think that um, we need to see different people, we need to be put at ease at different people, and that's going to be rough. Because when we go in different places, we're going to condescend. We're going to piss people off, if I could be, you know, speak bluntly. So the communities that we've got to go in you know, are going to give us some grief. But if everybody's doing it, regardless of what income you are, regardless of where you live, you have a stake. I mean, I don't understand why. I mean, I understand why, but I mean, I have all these fantasies. Like, you know, when, when unemployment was 10% and it was so hard among um, uh, um, recent high school male graduates, you know, to get a job. You know, why couldn't we get money to send those kids in Colorado and in Arizona and in California where all those trees are just waiting to combust and blow up and have sweeping fires across the West why can't we pay kids to go over there to do that and then bring them back home? I understand the logistic problems with it, but I do think that we need to show people that everybody has a role to play and we can't expect people to do it for us. And for those of us who are complacent, we need to have our butts kicked from here all the way home to say that it is not about us. Like the CCC camps. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, or, Ameri you know, or AmeriCorps. Yeah. You know. I mean, because cause I, I, I mean, I, um, I mean, I think people by and large are phenomenally really interesting, really kind, really caring people. They're just nervous. No. Well, I passed my time, and they're going to be out of tape, so I thank you very much for coming. <laughs>